Hello, my name is Steve and welcome to American Steam Legacy. This is part four of our series on the white notation where we take a look at the duplex drive locomotives. Baldwin began promoting the concept of a duplex drive locomotive for high-speed passenger service in the United States in the early 1930s. The idea, however, did not originate with Baldwin, nor were the famous Pennsylvania T1-class locomotives the first of the type. The French had built a duplex drive, or non-articulated Mallet, as early as 1863. It wasn't until the late 1930s that American railroads began to consider the duplex a viable improvement to steam power to compete with diesels. So, coming up next, American duplex locomotives of the white notation on American Steam Legacy. The first duplex drive locomotive to appear on American railroads was the Baltimore and Ohio's experimental locomotive designed by George H. Emerson, General Superintendent of Motive Power and Equipment for the Baltimore and Ohio. Emerson's creation was built in the Baltimore and Ohio Montclair shops in June of 1937 and was given the road number 5600 and a class designation of N1. Although the locomotive was rarely referred to by its class designation, the men of the Baltimore and Ohio simply referred to it as the George Emerson. At first glance, number 5600 looked like a 484 Northern type, but upon closer inspection it was obvious that this was no 484. It was a 4444. The eight drive wheels were split up into two sets of four coupled drivers each, driven by their own set of cylinders. This resulted in shorter and lighter main and drive rods and allowed for more precise counterbalancing on the 76 inch drive wheels. The cylinders on the front engine were located ahead of the drivers and flanked by the axles of a four wheel pilot truck. The cylinders on the rear engine were mounted in an opposing position behind the second set of drivers and under the firebox just ahead of the four wheel trailing truck. Since this was a rigid frame locomotive, the placement of the steam chests was to keep the overall wheelbase of the engine as short as possible. Both engines were driven by relatively small pistons at 18 inches in diameter and an unusual stroke of 26 and a half inches. The exhaust from both engines was carried to a common exhaust pipe to a single exhaust nozzle and smokestack. Steam was supplied by a water tube boiler operating at 350 psi, while the firebox was also a water tube type. The boiler and duplex drive combination provided a respectable 67,200 pounds of tractive effort and 3,900 horsepower. However, with a total locomotive weight of 391,500 pounds, 240,000 pounds of which carried by the drivers, resulted in a rather low factor of adhesion of 3.58. It's important to note that the lightweight drive rods and softer piston thrusts from the 18-inch cylinders were intended to prolong the life expectancy of the running gear and reduce maintenance costs. The water tube boiler was already known for high efficiency and lower coal consumption, which reduced operating costs as well. The George H. Emerson was placed in passenger service where it remained until the early 1940s. In 1939, the locomotive was on display at the New York World's Fair where it drew a considerable amount of attention. Overall, the George H. Emerson performed fairly well but was frequently sidelined by a mounting list of problems. The location of the rear steam chest left it vulnerable to frequent fouling due to its close proximity to the ash pan. The Emerson-designed water tube firebox was also an issue. Not only was it not properly insulated, resulting in a loss of thermal efficiency, but it was also sensitive to vibration. Ironically, premature axle bearing failures were also an issue. The very issue the lightweight running gear and improved counterbalancing was supposed to mitigate. While the locomotive was praised for its riding quality, its low factor of adhesion not only gave it a tendency to slip when starting, it also made precise stops a problem as well. On the plus side, the locomotive's moderate axle loading and ability to negotiate curves up to 13 degrees when running at speed, the George Emerson could operate virtually anywhere on the Baltimore and Ohio system. Perhaps some re-engineering could have made this a viable design, but the Baltimore and Ohio elected to remove it from service in the early 1940s and keep it in storage until scrapping in October of 1950. The Pennsylvania Railroad's loan 6446 duplex was built by the railroad's Juniata shops in 1939, but its design was a four-way collaboration between the Pennsylvania Railroad and the big three steam locomotive builders Lima, Alco, and Baldwin. The design originated from the same place all new locomotive designs come from, 
a railroad's need to put more power behind one throttle. The Pennsylvania Railroad required a locomotive that could pull heavy passenger trains at speeds in excess of 60 miles per hour unassisted. This is a requirement that usually involved double heading. Upon completion, the experimental locomotive was given the road number 6100 and the class designation S1. Everything about the S1 was huge. A cast steel pilot truck housed three wheel sets with wheels 36 inches in diameter when 33 inches was the norm. The two four coupled sets of Baldwin disc drive wheels measured 84 inches in diameter, while a three axle trailer housed wheels 42 inches in diameter. All axles and running gear were made to use Timken roller bearings. The locomotive alone weighed 608,000 pounds, but less than half of that weight was carried by the drive wheels, resulting in a low adhesion factor of 3.68. The tender was also very large, measuring 60 feet in length and riding on two six-wheel trucks. It carried 26 tons of coal and 24,000 gallons of water. The size and weight of the S1 rivaled that of the Union Pacific Big Boy, which wouldn't arrive from Alco for another two years. The total engine and tender weight came in at 1,060,000 pounds and an overall length of 140 feet, 5 feet longer than the Big Boy and less than 200,000 pounds lighter. However, when it came to tractive effort, the Big Boy wins hands down. 135,000 pounds for the Big Boy, 76,400 pounds for the S1. The S1's horsepower was also comparable to that of the Big Boy as well. 6,500 horsepower and 6,900 horsepower, respectively. Incidentally, the Pennsylvania Railroad personnel affectionately referred to the S1 as the big engine. A conventional fire tube boiler operating at 300 PSI supplied steam to both engines with cylinders 22 inches in diameter. However, unlike the Baltimore and Ohio duplex, each engine exhausted to its own exhaust pipe, necessitating twin stacks atop the smoke box. Adding to the locomotive's impressive appearance was streamlined cladding designed by Raymond Lowy, but just like its Baltimore and Ohio counterpart, it too was put on display at the New York World's Fair in 1939. Not to be outdone by their competitor to the south, the Pennsylvania Railroad placed the S-1 on a stand that allowed the locomotive to operate under its own steam. While most agreed the S-1 was a capable passenger locomotive that gave trouble-free service, it did develop a reputation for slipping due to its low factor of adhesion. The S-1 could easily move a 1,200-ton passenger train at speeds of 100 miles per hour. There are numerous unconfirmed reports of the S-1 reaching speeds well in excess of 110 miles per hour. One such report came from an assistant road foreman of the Pennsylvania Railroad's Fort Wayne Division. The road foreman claims to have observed the speedometer pegged at 110 miles per hour on a test run between Fort Wayne, Indiana and Chicago, Illinois. He then pulled out a stopwatch and timed the train between two stations in Indiana. A distance of 6.3 miles was covered in 170 seconds, which works out to a speed of 133 miles per hour. While other reports claim speeds in excess of 150 miles per hour, while these reports were never verified and no official attempt at a world speed record was ever attempted, Pennsylvania Railroad engineers did praise the T1 for its power, speed, and superior riding qualities. The S1's downfall can be attributed to its sheer size and weight. Its length was more than existing turning facilities could handle, and while special facilities were built at Crestline, Ohio to house and maintain the locomotive, the railments were frequent even though a special Y track was constructed for the S1. The locomotive's weight was also an issue. Rail lighter than 117 pounds per yard couldn't handle a locomotive this heavy and traveling at such high speeds, which limited the S1's route availability. The long rigid frame didn't allow the S1 to negotiate sharp curves that were abundant on the Pennsylvania Railroad system, further restricting its route availability. Unfortunately, the one-of-a-kind S1 was pulled from service in May 1946 and scrapped in 1949. But on a positive note, the lessons learned from the S1 were applied to other Pennsylvania Railroad duplex locomotives, most notably the T1. With the lessons learned from the S1, Baldwin and the Pennsylvania Railroad were not ready to give up on the duplex as a more efficient steam locomotive. By the time the S1 had been pulled from service, the U.S. had become involved in World War II. And even with the rationing of resources by the War Production Board, the Pennsylvania Railroad still believed in the duplex concept and designed a better duplex locomotive. In 1942, the War Production Board allowed the Pennsylvania Railroad to construct two new duplex locomotives for passenger service. The two prototype locomotives were the first of the T1 class, number 6110 and 6111. While the two were identical twins, number 6111 was equipped with a Franklin booster engine in its trailing truck, producing an additional 13,500 pounds of tractive effort. Raymond Lowy was once again tasked with designing the streamlined cladding that gave the T1s their distinctive appearance. 
Like the Baltimore and Ohio's George Emerson from four years earlier, the T1s had a 4-4-4-4 wheel configuration. Two four-coupled engines flanked by a four-wheel pilot and a four-wheel trailer. The boiler was a traditional fire tube type operating at 300 PSI. The drive wheels were 4 inches smaller than those of the S1 at 80 inches in diameter. The cylinders were also of a smaller diameter at 19.75 inches while retaining the same stroke of 26 inches. Rather than employing the traditional reciprocating spool valve to control steam flow into and out of the cylinders, the T1 utilized poppet valves that operated on a similar principle to those in automobile engines. However, the camshaft oscillated rather than rotating in time with the engine. Perhaps the biggest improvement was the fact the T1s were of a more manageable size that the railroad's infrastructure could actually handle. The T1s were over 100,000 pounds lighter than the S1 and had a wheelbase 12 feet shorter. These characteristics gave the T1 a far greater route availability. The T1's tractive effort was a respectable 64,650 pounds and horsepower came in at 6,000 at a speed of 62 miles per hour. Like the S1s, the T1s were fast and powerful locomotives. The T1 could manage a speed of 100 miles per hour with a full tonnage passenger consist in tow. Some reports claim a speed of 125 miles per hour were achieved. Also, like the S1, the T1 had its drawbacks as well. While the streamlined cladding and shark nose front end gave the T1 its distinctive look, the airflow around the boiler when running at speed kept smoke close to the sides of the locomotive, causing the cab to fill with smoke. Another issue was with the gearboxes that drove the poppet valves. The gearboxes themselves were quite reliable, but their location made them nearly inaccessible for maintenance. The gearbox for the front engine was located under the pilot shrouding, behind the aftercooler, and between the air pumps. The one for the rear engine was positioned behind the cylinder saddle and mounted vertically inside the frame. Perhaps the most well-known issue with the T1 is drive wheel slippage, particularly when running at speed. The root cause of the problem was unequal weight distribution on the front and rear engines. Even though the T1 had a very good overall adhesion factor of 4.33, the lighter weight carried on the rear engine gave it a tendency to slip. While some sources claim the wheel slippage at speed issue is overstated, the Pennsylvania Railroad did explore the possibility of fitting the rear engine with an electromechanical anti-slip mechanism. If there was a loss of traction, the anti-slip mechanism would bring the rear engine back under control without any intervention from the engineer. The T1 did enjoy greater longevity than the S1, however its service time would span little more than a decade. Between 1942 and 1946, a total of 52 T1s would be built, 27 by Baldwin and 25 constructed by the Pennsylvania Railroad. By 1952, the T1s would begin being taken out of service in batches, with all 52 being scrapped by 1956. 1942 was to be a busy year for the Pennsylvania Railroad. As the first of the T1-class duplex locomotives were entering passenger service, the Juniata shops were building a duplex for passenger and freight service that would be the last dual-service locomotive built for the Pennsylvania Railroad. The Q1-class, as it would be known, had to first overcome the same obstacle as the T1, the War Production Board. But since the Pennsylvania Railroad's immediate plans were for one locomotive, and given the Pennsylvania Railroad's influence, Construction of the lone member of the Q1 class was given the go-ahead. The Q1 was an unusual design. Its 4644 wheel arrangement was unorthodox, but the peculiar aspects of this locomotive didn't stop there. While the front and rear engines had six and four drive wheels respectively, the bore and stroke was different as well. The front six-coupled engine had cylinders 23 inches in diameter and a stroke of 28 inches, while the rear four-coupled engine had cylinders 19.5 inches in diameter and a stroke of 26 inches. While the difference in cylinder diameter might suggest compounding, the Q1's two engines received steam directly from the boiler. Both engines had 77-inch drive wheels, and steam flow was managed by a conventional Walshertz valve gear. The boiler was a conventional fire tube type operating at 300 PSI. Due to the rear engine's inverted position, its rather large steam chest crowded the firebox, resulting in a smaller furnace and less evaporative heating surface area than, than what would otherwise have been provided. In terms of performance, the Q1 was only a slight improvement over the T1. The Q1 produced 81,800 pounds of tractive effort, a substantial increase over the T1's 64,600 pounds for the 50 production variants. Horsepower for the Q1 came in at 6,600 at 60 miles per hour. The Q1 developed a reputation for being slippery in spite of its very good adhesion factor of 4.34. But this wasn't its most serious problem. The position of the rear engine produced the same reliability problem suffered by the George Emerson. 
The constant fouling and accelerated cylinder wear had the Q1 spending more time in the shop than on the road. Since the Q1 was intended to be a dual-service locomotive, the choice of such large drive wheels may have been adequate for passenger service, but not so much for freight. Ironically, there is no record of the Q1 ever being used in passenger service. Unfortunately for the Q1, the Pennsylvania Railroad, for the most part, went down the same road as the Baltimore and Ohio and met with the same results. The Q1 would remain in service until July of 1949 and scrapped later that year. The Q2 class would be the Pennsylvania Railroad's final duplex design. Some wonder why the railroad even bothered to continue with steam development so late in the steam era. With the rise of diesel locomotives and the T1 being the only duplex design that could be remotely considered successful, the Pennsylvania Railroad decided to make one last attempt at the duplex concept. The first of the 26 Q2s that would be built arrived from the Pennsylvania Railroad's Juniata shops in 1944, with the remaining 25 arriving in 1945 and 1946. The Q2 was a reworked and improved version of the preceding Q1. Both engines faced forward this time, and the four- and six-coupled drive wheels traded places resulting in a 4-4-6-4 wheel arrangement. The two sets of running gear retained the unequal bore and stroke of the Q1. The front four-coupled engine with a 19 and 3 quarter inch cylinder diameter and a 28-inch stroke, while the six-coupled rear set had cylinders 23 and 3 quarter inches in diameter and a 29-inch stroke. Just like the T1, the boiler was a fire tube type operating at 300 PSI. With the steam chest of the rear engine no longer crowding the firebox, the size of the firebox was increased by nearly 20%, and the number of boiler flues was increased from 236 for the Q1 to 277 for the Q2. Tractive effort and horsepower were very impressive. The Q2 developed almost 8,000 horsepower at 57 miles per hour under test. Tractive effort was 100,800 pounds, with a trailing truck booster providing 15,000 pounds more. Oddly enough, the Q2's size, tractive effort, and weight were comparable to that of the Rhodes J-Class 210 4s. But unlike the J-Class, the Q2 had two major problems. The first was efficiency. The Q2 had an enormous appetite for coal and water. In one hour of hard running, 16,600 gallons of water and 12.5 tons of coal would be consumed. This prompted the Pennsylvania Railroad to tell engine crews to plan on stopping for water every hour and a half. The second issue was the boiler. The boiler seam located near the steam chest of the front engine was prone to developing leaks on a regular basis and had to be recalked. The high fuel and water consumption and high maintenance costs eventually led to the Q2 meeting the same fate as the Q1, with all being scrapped. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. And once again, my name's Steve, and thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.